بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم ان شاء الله today's presentation will be presented by Ustad Firas not by myself I'm just here to introduce him uh, today's topic ان شاء الله is a very important topic uh, as many of us or all of us are aware that alhamdulillah the Qasim received this license as a college but what exactly does this mean or where does this fit into Islamic history what are the effects of this etc etc so with that, Ustad Firas, inshallah, will uh, present to us today. Ustad Firas holds a BA in uh, history. He also uh, has uh, a master's in Middle Eastern Civilization uh, Studies. And he's also currently uh, pursuing his PhD in uh, UFC. Uh, so inshallah, Ustad Firas will uh, introduce to us this topic. And inshallah, we'll shed some light on this. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, so Sheikh Amin asked me to present on this. Um, as Mufti Hisham said, with Dada Qasim getting licensed um, as a college, not accredited, by the way, I think that's an important thing, an uh, important uh, uh, thing to distinguish. There's a little bit of a difference between accreditation in terms of programs and license to operate as a college. So right now we're at the the point of operating as a college. Um, we think it's important for us to understand what this means in terms of how we relate to the Western intellectual tradition that we live in, right? And whether we're talking from an academic perspective or even from the perspective of being people who live in a Western society, uh, this is an important topic to, to grasp just so that we understand what exactly Dada Qasim is interested in doing in the future and what we have been doing in the past anyways. Um, so without further ado, I think the foundation from which we begin to understand the differences and perhaps some overlap between what Dada Qasim College does and what Western academia does is to talk about epistemology. And epistemology is one of those fancy words that academics use to sound smarter than they might actually be. Um, when you start usually any kind of grad school program, they tell you, you know, don't, don't use fancy words just for the sake of being fancy and, and write simply so that people understand. And then everything they teach you after that is to write very complexly and to make sure that nobody actually understands what you're talking about. Uh, and epistemology is one of those words. It, it's really very simple. It literally is just your philosophy of knowledge or your sources of knowledge, all right? Um, so while we might look at non-Muslim institutions or the entire Western intellectual tradition, and even if you only have a basic elementary understanding of Islam or Islamic history or, or Muslim history or whatever, you would immediately be able to tell, all right, they're coming to very different conclusions from us, right? There's something off here, right? And for a lot of people, this leads to um, a kind of unresolved tension. They don't know how to deal with these very intelligent people who are saying things about Islam that just doesn't correlate with what we know. And, and for a lot of people, it really becomes a big problem because in most cases, we have trouble comprehending the differences in epistemology between our approach and the Western intellectual approach. And in order to understand this, we have to understand a little bit about Western history. Inshallah, I'm not going to bore everyone to death right now. You can sign up for one of my classes at Dada Qasim. We can do that later, inshallah. Um, but we have to recognize that um, Western history, and by this I mean specifically European history for the most part, and obviously the U.S. and, and Canada uh, fits into this a little bit later in history. But European history for the past 500 years has been dominated by this backlash against um, the Middle Ages or the medieval era or you know the Dark Ages, although that term is, is very problematic and we'll see why that is in just a minute. Um, and if you know anything about European history, you're, you know, things like Galileo's Inquisition and whatnot and the Protestant Reformation and all of these kind of rebellions against the power of the Catholic Church were very, very impactful on the way that European society thought of itself. All right. So you have to keep in mind, back in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church had almost, you know, uh, complete power. 
right? The Pope literally would be the one to put crowns on king's heads, right? To declare them to be legitimate or illegitimate. If you're excommunicated, you're essentially just completely out of society, out of the church, out of everything like that. So you have a number of different movements that, uh, that arise in, um, uh, in rebellion or at least in, in, um, in contradistinction to the Catholic church. And, uh, as a result of this, you have this backlash that kind of swings the pendulum very far in the other direction, right? So whereas medieval European society was very religious to the point that the Catholic Church completely, you know, uh, managed society, the, the backlash against this was to try to remove religion from all aspects of life, right? And this intense skepticism that arose as a result of this backlash against the Catholic Church. So this is why you have, for example, without going too much into details, you know, when Galileo says that the earth is not the center of, of the universe, it's actually the sun or, or whatever. Um, the reason that the Catholic Church was so adamantly against him was because they were kind of paranoid of all of these rebellious movements, whether it was Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation or, or what have you all of these different things that suddenly are shaking at the core of the way that they conceived of, of themselves. And then that further pushed the scientific revolution further away from the Catholic church. And it's kind of a, an ongoing story. Now it's very important to note, uh, I am simplifying to the extreme here, right? Um, you know, if a professor of, you know, Western philosophy and history was here right now, he'd probably get up and, and you know, have some things to say, but I'm I'm simplifying to the point that just so we understand where we are coming from in terms of Western history. Um, so this now leads to this notion that exists in Western, in European uh, intellectualism, and also it it trickles down to the level of society that the past is necessarily worse than the present. Okay. This is one of the foundations that we don't think about, but almost all of us, even if you're not born in the United States or raised here, the whole world is essentially Western in some sense or another. You can be born in pretty much anywhere in the world, and this is the way that you tend to think, that the past is necessarily worse or less progressive or less advanced or whatever than where we are today. And in some cases, that actually is true, right? I mean, if you look at American history, 160 years ago, you have slavery, and now we don't have slavery. So that seems like progressive kind of uh, uh, improvement. Um, but if this is your base of understanding, right, and to use Arabic terminology here, we can, we can refer to this as the usul of Western intellectualism, that the past is backwards, the past is necessarily regressive, and the future is progressive. You cannot help but try to recreate society, recreate intellectualism, recreate civilization itself on a regular basis. And the most extreme example of this, if you study any European history, is the French Revolution, right? It wasn't just a matter that the king uh, was oppressive, which he certainly was. And Marie Antoinette probably never actually said, let them eat cake, but her actions certainly did indicate that. Right? You have people that are rioting because there's just not enough food and, and the king and, and the church are just insanely wealthy and powerful and the average person doesn't have anything. I mean, that actually is a problem. But the forces that came to undo that didn't just try to uh, redistribute wealth in a more equitable manner, but to fundamentally reshape society. Right to the point that the that the uh, French Revolution ended up trying to to change everything. Even time was changed. There was no longer a sixty minute hour. There was no longer a seven day week. They tried to go to a ten day week. They were like, this is just more efficient. They changed the names of all the days of the week, uh, all the months of the year, everything like that. Like they fundamentally tried to reshape society in their own image. Obviously, that didn't work. Napoleon comes in. Long story. Um, the point that I'm trying to get, get at here, though, is that when you conceive of Western society or the Western mind, you conceive of a progressive approach, right? That we might have little hiccups along the way. So kind of think of a, a, a chart over time, right? You have this necessarily increasing at y equals mx plus b type thing where, where the slope is constantly positive. You might have little hiccups the Holocaust and World War II where 120 million people are killed. But for the most part, things are getting better over time. 
Now, I don't need to uh, harp on this point, but we as Muslims fundamentally disagree with that. Right? And this is part of our aqidah that nothing could have possibly ever been better than the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And he tells us this, that he is the best of, of all creation and then the next is, uh, is his sahaba and then the generation after that and the generation after that. So this idea of a progressive approach towards world history is something that we fundamentally cannot agree with. Even if we do tend to imbue it unconsciously within ourselves in the way that we think about society around us. So now, how does this apply to academia? What, what does any of this actually mean for the purposes of Dal Qasim being a college in an academic landscape? You take this approach of a progressive history and you apply it to the study of history, or you apply it specifically to the study of religion, as it was understood in uh, Western Europe. And you have this intense skepticism that develops with regards to the origins of religions. Right, so if you look at European history in the 1800s in particular, you have this rise of religious studies, um, particularly focusing on Christianity and Judaism and focusing on the origins of those religions that is steeped in skepticism to the point that a lot of people are denying that Jesus ever existed and they're questioning the origins of the Bible. Now, from our perspective, obviously, we believe that Prophet Isa Islam existed, but they want to question the origins of the Bible. We would say, like, yeah, we also have problems with the history of, of uh, the text of the Bible. The problem for them, however, is that they cannot conceive of any holy book or any, te or any text at all being preserved, right? And this is the influence of the scientific revolution, right? The scientific revolution, if you all remember, and hopefully back to like middle school or high school when you're doing the whole scientific method and things like that, it's based on empiricism. It's based on what you can actually observe, right? So now you apply that to things like a manuscript tradition or the history of texts, and you say, okay, well, we don't have any original copies of the Bible, right? It doesn't exist. Even, I mean, Christian scholars will tell you that it wasn't written down until you know, at least 100 years later is when the four Gospels and talking about the New Testament, uh, the four Gospels are written down. And then even then, there's kind of like an editing process that goes on for hundreds of years. But the earliest, earliest even fragments of manuscripts that we have are from like hundreds of years after Prophet Isa So in, in uh, college uh, uh, departments of, of uh, history and religion, they now have this extreme skepticism as it applies to Christianity. Right, to the point where there's just this base assumption that Christianity is, is falsified and the Bible is falsified and, and things like that. Again, we're okay with, with aspects of, of that narrative. But now when they apply it to the Islamic tradition, they can't get over that hump. They can't get over the fact that we believe that the Quran actually is preserved. Now, this is entirely separate from the idea of uh, the miraculous revelation of the Quran. That's something that empiricism just can't deal with anyways because by nature of what some, something being a miracle, it's not empirical, right? It's not something that actually can be observed and scientifically, scientifically studied. You can't do any kind of scientific experiment that will prove that the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through angels revealed. Forget about that. Let's say that even just the Quran that existed at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is it the same as the Quran that we have today? For us, this is something that we take for granted, right? For them, it's something that they cannot accept whatsoever. And the reason for that is, and I'm sure you've all heard Sheikh Amin talk about the oral tradition and the written tradition, right? We don't have any manuscripts from the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And uh, every now and then they'll come across something that they can carve and date and place it to that time period or, or whatever. But we don't believe that the Quran is preserved through a written tradition. We fundamentally believe that it is preserved through an oral tradition. And this is something that they cannot accept at all. Any kind of oral uh, preservation or oral tradition just does not work with the scientific approach towards history of this notion of empiricism. My point in bringing all this up is to illustrate that there is a difference between usul and furu'ah. All right, and this applies obviously in our studies of fiqh, but it also applies to our study of, in, of academia as a whole. We have to think about what are the usul of academia, right? As I said earlier, any Muslim would 
read something that a non-Muslim academic writes about the origin of Islam and we have this tension, we're like, ah, that, that doesn't work. And we might not be able to put our finger on why or we might and say, well, that thing right there is totally wrong. That's a lie about the Prophet or whatever. But it's not just a matter of pointing out the furu'ah, the branches, and pointing out that that thing is wrong, that thing is wrong, that thing is wrong. We have to actually understand what are the sources. And this is why I hopefully didn't put anyone to sleep, talking about the history of European intellectualism and why they think the way that they do. It's all reactionary, right? And that's their history. That's, that's their problems with their past, and that's fine. They can kind of deal with that on their own time. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that there is this fundamental difference in usul, right? Whereas from our perspective, we not only accept the oral tradition, but we prize the oral tradition. And that's kind of the way that we understand our entire approach towards religion. For them, that's something that they fundamentally cannot accept. And this is why you end up having things like, for example, you might have heard uh, the name of uh, uh, Patricia Crona, right? Who writes this book back in the 1970s essentially where she argues, or she's trying to trace the origins of Islam without using any Islamic sources whatsoever. Um, so only using what, you know, Christian priests up in Syria would have said about 100 years afterwards, because that'll be the earliest kind of stuff that we have. And the conclusions of that book are just totally ludicrous, to the point where it's so bad that even a lot of other academics in the past 50 years have kind of disregarded huge aspects of, of, her, of her work. Um, but that's a matter of an usuli difference that's leading to furu'i differences, all right? Now, it's important to note, by the way, before I continue, that I, I hope I'm not painting with a broad brush and, and saying that, you know, everyone in academia, everyone in, in Western universities is just this moron and things like that who doesn't understand. There is actually quite a big contingent of people within academia who understand where we come from, even if they don't agree with it. They're intelligent enough to understand what the Islamic sources of knowledge are and how that difference differs from the way that they approach things. Um, relatively speaking, though, those are not as, as often as, as they should be. Now, the question from here becomes, now that we understand that there's a difference between the way that Muslims engage academically and the way that Western, at least most Western institutions engage academically, we have to think about how do we engage with them? All right. Is there a way that any institution, whether it's Dar al-Qasim or, or any place where you have ulama, how can we now engage when you have this seemingly insurmountable um, barrier between the two of us? Now, the first thing that needs to occur is obviously you need to have a deep understanding of the Islamic tradition itself. All right. You cannot go and become, you know, this is the wrong term to use, but a crusader fighting for uh, the Islamic sciences in academia, if you yourself don't actually understand what Islam is, right? The Islamic intellectual tradition, inshallah, by everybody being here and, and you know, loving Sheikh Amin and loving Dar al-Qasim, you have a little bit of an idea of, of how deep and rich this intellectual tradition is. I mean, we've heard scholars talk about, like, even if you study for decades, you're still not really a scholar or something like that, which, you know, is, is a... a maybe an exaggeration, but the point is that like, it's a very, very deep intellectual tradition. You cannot defend this tradition if you don't know it, obviously. I mean, this hopefully goes without saying. Um, but we do have historical examples of people who dove deep into our intellectual tradition and then use that to engage across this usuli divide. And the most famous and perhaps most obvious example is Imam al-Ghazali, right, who, you know, even before he engage with, engages with uh, philosophy, he had to become Imam al-Ghazali. He had to become the master of the Islamic sciences that we, know, uh, that we know of today. But then at his time, you have, um, you know, the, this, uh, uh, this plethora of, of uh, not psychological, of uh, philosophical works by people like Ibn Sina, Al-Kindi, Farabi in particular, those three, that are based almost entirely on the usul of the ancient Greeks, right? Ibn Sina, for example, essentially is an Aristotelian, right? He does add a few of his own things, but his usul is Aristotelian, right? So the conclusions that he comes up with are necessarily things that we disagree with. The most notable one being, for example, that the earth has always existed, right? That the earth has, is co-eternal with God. Um, and there was tons of Muslims at that time who said, well, that's wrong, 
right? We don't believe in that. That goes directly against the Nusus. We, we reject that as, uh, as Islamic belief. Imam al-Ghazali had to go a step further and understand philosophy from the perspective of the philosophers, right? That's how he's able to then write a book called Tahafut al-Falasifa, the incoherence of the philosophers. He didn't title it where the philosophers are wrong, which he could have done. And the first couple pages of, of his book, he just lists, I think, like 30 different points where he says the philosophers are wrong. Uh, his book could have been one page. And there were other people who did write things like that, where they just listed off, this is where the philosophers are wrong, don't believe these things, and your aqidah is fine. Imam al-Ghazali actually goes deep into uh, uh, Aristotelian philosophy, and he shows points where that usul itself contradicts. Right? He shows how even if you use Aristotelian uh, philosophy, the conclusions that you come up with are incoherent, right? Thus the title, Tahafut al-Falasifa, the incoherence of the philosophers. Um, so the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that you can engage with them, but it has to be at the level of usul. It cannot be at the level of just pointing out this is wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. That might work for, you know, the, the uh, stereotypical example is, you know, a 100-year-old farmer, like, living on uh, a farm in Palestine or something like that. Like, you know, my grandmother, for example, probably did not need a bunch of philosophical proofs for anything, right? She just believed that God exists because she believes that God exists, right? Um, but academically speaking, there's another level that does need to be engaged, right? And you don't throw Imam Ghazali's Tahafut al-Falasifa at a farmer and then expect them to, to read it and understand it. This is, you know, in the ivory tower, for lack of a better term, although that term has a lot of uh, negative connotation. A second example, obviously, from much more uh, recent history is the foundation of Dal Ulum Dioband, which was in direct response to the British conquest of the Indian subcontinent, right? Where for hundreds of years, almost a thousand years at that point in history, Muslims had been the supreme power in at least northern India, right, in the Ganges River Plain. Uh, and then suddenly that kind of collapses under the control of the British East India Company. And then you have the Sepoy Rebellion, uh, which leads directly to the establishment of the British Raj, right? So now Muslim control is completely gone. Any kind of Muslim uh, or even Hindu uh, uh, military uh, responses to this failed, right? The Mughal Empire was not able to keep up. There's a number of different reasons for that. And, and you know, we can talk about that at another point in time. but the military approach didn't work, you're going to have to engage intellectually, right? And that's what Diobando is founded on. Obviously, preserving the Islamic sciences, right? So that even if there is no Islamic government or Muslim government, you can still propagate these sciences and make sure that everyone understands what their deen is supposed to be. But once you have that done, now you can go on to the next level and say, okay, well, this is why this Western hegemonic approach doesn't work. From a, from a base usuli perspective. And although it wasn't part of the, the exact curriculum, if you had gone to the library of Dal Ulum Dioband at that time, you would have found all of the works of English literature and all of the works of Western philosophy. They were well known, right? They had no problem reading and engaging with these things so that they understood the people who had just conquered them so that we can combat them intellectually, right? And we have many cases of, of the... Uh, founding uh, members of Dal Ulum Dioban kind of like engaging in debate with the British and just completely schooling them, right? Because they, I mean, our intellectual tradition just blows everything else out of the water, right? If it's properly understood. Um, and if you look throughout Muslim history, you're going to find tons of examples of this, right? Uh, you know, I don't know much about Chinese Muslim history, but every now and then you come across something where you find Muslim Chinese scholars, which by the way, if you don't know, there's a huge contingent of, of Muslim Chinese scholarship that's existed in the eastern parts of China. I'm not talking about the Uyghurs in the west, I'm talking about uh, in the east, uh, who have been there for hundreds of years, who have engaged intellectually with the local traditions. Now, you can't engage with China on the same basis that you engage with Western philosophy, right? Because they have completely differing usul. So you have books that are written about uh, you know, Islamic metaphysics that's engaging with Confucianism and legalism and Buddhism and showing how those philosophies don't match up with what we have, right? And engaging with those at a very basic level. In the late Ottoman Empire, you have uh, engagement with uh, what would later, what we now call modernism, right? You have a book called Yeni Ilmi Kalam, which literally means the new science of Kalam 
which was the same as the old science of Kalam, but has on a few extra chapters talking about all the latest uh, European philosophers that, are, that exist at that time. So now, what does this mean with regards to Dar al-Qasim being licensed as a college? The number one thing uh, that this means is that it proves to everyone, both in the Muslim community and outside of it, because if we're being frank, unfortunately, a lot of time Muslims themselves have trouble taking madrasas and seminaries seriously and things like that. Um, it proves to everyone that we have intellectual rigor that is at least on par with what Western academia offers, right? We are a college, they are colleges, right? For us to be licensed by these, by, uh, uh, on the same level as these colleges is actually huge. It's not an easy process. And as you all heard a couple of weeks ago with uh, Maulana Bilal and, and Dr. Hassan and, uh, and Hafiz Nauman talking about the actual process that we had to go through in order to become uh, licensed is a very difficult process. But the amazing thing is that we didn't have to um, compromise on anything. We showed them our curriculum, we showed them what we study, and we showed them how it was intellectually rigorous, more so than the kind of education that you'd get, at, certainly at a bachelor's level at any college in Chicago or probably the entire country, and showed that we surpassed that, right? So at least from, a, from the perspective of you know, nomenclature and calling ourselves a college, now people have to take us seriously. Uh, even if they would disagree with uh, some of the conclusions or even some of the that we, uh, that we uh, uh, set forth. Now, another important thing to note here, though, is that if you actually want to have an effect on society and the world around you, that's only done through the intellectual realm. Now, this is not to denigrate work that is done, quote unquote, on the ground, right? Um, not at all. But when we're talking about long-term impacts, something that is going to have an effect way after you have passed on, that is only done through the intellectual realm. And I'll give you a few examples from Western history because that's what we're engaging with right now. Um, I mentioned the French Revolution earlier, right? The French Revolution is in the late 1700s, early 1800s, right? The seeds of that are planted hundreds of years earlier, right? When you look at the in, quote unquote enlightenment philosophers, and I mentioned earlier, I don't like the term dark ages, right? The term dark ages comes from the enlightenment. And just think about the way that these words are used, right? To call something an enlightenment has a very positive connotation. To call something a dark age, obviously it wasn't always cloudy and rainy in the dark ages, despite, you know, when you watch a movie that takes place in the dark ages, it's always literally dark, right? That's probably not how it was. Uh, in fact, I mean, side note, just because this stuff is kind of interesting to me, you know, there's, they actually dressed very colorfully in the dark ages, like even peasants and things like that wore like very colorful clothing. They had like tons of festivals all the time, probably still wasn't a great time to live in, but I mean, relative to the way that we, that we can uh, conceive of it is very different. Um, anyways, uh, this, uh, this era of enlightenment as it's called, right, you had people like uh, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, uh, Hume, Descartes, Montesquieu, all of these philosophers that hopefully are ringing some bells for you from high school and, and maybe college classes. These are people who just kind of sat down and just reacted to the world that they were living in and then just wrote down some of the craziest ideas that they had, right? And that's fine. I mean, that's what an intellectual does, right? You come up with crazy ideas and probably nobody's going to take you seriously during your lifetime. But over the course of decades and then centuries afterwards, this actually has a huge impact on the way that European society viewed itself, right? So Locke and Hobbes are in the 1500s, 1600s. It's not until the American Revolution in the late 1700s that particularly Locke's ideas actually have an effect on a government, right? So for 100, 100 plus years, almost 200 years, you know, his ideas are just out there academically in the world. And people are engaging with them sometimes and other people are writing against it and, and whatever. That's fine. That's what, that's what an academic does. But eventually these ideas take hold with enough people that it causes a literal revolution, right? And then it, after the American Revolution succeeds, it does the same thing in France. And then from there you have this wholesale just upheaval of European society and the way that they think about the world around them and, and all of this that we're talking about in terms of... Um, Western academia. So now for us, alhamdulillah, to be 
uh, licensed as a college, we already know that we can do the work, right? We already know intellectually that there's nothing that Western academia can do that matches what happens within these walls, alhamdulillah. But now this shows the Muslim community and it shows the non-Muslim community as well, the non-Muslim academic community that you guys actually have to do take our ideas seriously. Right. And we're not going to compromise. Right. We didn't have to compromise during the licensing process. And you guys all know Sheikh Amin. He's not going to compromise on, on any of this stuff. Right. Alhamdulillah. That's alhamdulillah why we're all here. Um, or we, we can set our own terms. We won't be dictated to. And if there is anything that actually is, is um, I would say, a, a promising sign over the past couple of decades, kind of promising sign over the past couple of decades of Western academia, is that um, the rise of postmodernism has opened up the door to kind of attacking the usul of Western society. Now, make no mistake, postmodernism is a hugely problematic idea, right? And, and we can have you know, an entire lecture series about that, and I'm, I'm not qualified to, to be the one to talk about that, but it's a, it's a fascinating kind of movement that essentially, after World War II, Europeans are so disillusioned with everything they thought they believed Right? Because leading up to World War II, they have all these ideas about how to reshape society. And if only society was fully democratic, everything would be great. If only society was fully communist, everything would be great. If only society was fully fascist, everything would be great. These three ideas kind of clash and just destroy everything in, in Europe. So that generation that grew up after that, they were so disillusioned with this that they said, you know, the whole idea of being confident, the whole idea of, of saying, I know what I'm doing. I know what my intellectual sources are that whole idea needs to just be thrown out, right? And that's what postmodernism is, this kind of uh, incredulity towards meta-narratives, I think is, you know, the fancy academic way that they, that, that they talk about it. But at least what this has done over the past couple of decades is it's opened the door for people to say, okay, well, the traditional ways that Western academia has operated are not working, and they are uh, exclusive, they don't account for a kind of plethora of epistemologies, so we can hopefully ride a little bit of that wave without agreeing with the usul of postmodernism and say, look, if you guys are going to say that this, you know, you only need to rely on an academic, on a uh, written tradition and you deny the existence of an oral tradition, well, the postmodernists say that you can't insist on that anyways and our approach is just as legitimate as your approach, right? So this now opens a door for us to be taken seriously as an academic institution. Again, all of this... Uh, to quote Sheikh Min, this uh, a college is meant to be the face of the community out to everyone else, right? This isn't for us, right? We know who we are. We know that our academic rigor is unmatched, right? Not just at Al Qasim. I'm talking about the entire Muslim intellectual tradition. Nothing matches this, alhamdulillah. Uh, but this is for everyone else to see that, like, no, 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 actually, we are serious. And you guys have to take us seriously, whether you like it or not, because now we're a college. Right, and we're on the same footing as as everyone else. Um, and one last thing that's important to note, uh, and hopefully this isn't us tooting our own horns or anything like that, but there is uh, a significance to us being in the United States and doing this because you can't really do this anywhere else, right? Even in much of the Muslim world, if you want to be a proper college or university, you have to go by the rules that the government sets for you. Right, which is why a lot of universities in the Muslim world end up preaching things that are very contrary to our Islamic tradition. Right, and every Muslim country has its own kind of uh, cultural and social baggage and, and things like that. Here, we're able to do that without compromising on anything. Right, that's one of the nice things about separation of church and state. Uh, if there is anything nice about it, is that we didn't have to say, "Okay, well, we're going to change our curriculum and add in a course about you know American civics or anything like that, or about American history." Our curriculum is what it is. And it's not going to change, right? At least it's not going to change in accordance with what they dictate to us, right? We have the intellectual freedom to say what we want. Um, and that's something that, that is relatively, uh, alhamdulillah, unique here. So anyways, I don't want to continue to go on and, and bore everyone. Uh, hopefully this isn't boring at all. Uh, I find history interesting, and I hope that you do as well. Um, but these are just a few points that uh, Sheikh Amin wanted me to, to share with everyone in terms of what it actually means from the perspective of the intellectual environment that we live in, um, to be able to say that we are a college, you have to take us seriously, our intellectual rigor is unmatched, and 
from the perspective of the Muslim community, hopefully this allows us to just kind of start to see, start to think about why do we think the way that we do about things. That whole progressive idea of history, right? The way that we think about um, uh, society and, and civilization and its development over time, right? We have a fundamentally different approach to that than the entire Western world. And having the platform of a college allows us to put that out there for everyone. Uh, so obviously continue to make the for Dal Qasim and, and, um, and the future of, of what we can accomplish, uh, inshallah. So, Jazakallah khair.